Good morning, Harvest family. If you're visiting with us this morning, I don't want you to think that you're not Harvest family as well. Because if you are here just as a visitor, if you uh, are just curious about what we're doing with this live stream, or if you tried to take a selfie or something like that and hit the wrong button, and now you're on the Harvest page, uh, your family with us today right here and right now that's that's how we roll so that we're glad that you're here with us today you know I was um, I'm here at the church and I'm looking out uh, in our worship center and I can see each one of you sitting right here because you know early this morning well it was really more like the middle of the night the Lord woke me up I was thinking back over the history of Harvest and how many places that we have done church at and how many times we've had to move. And even in this facility, when we were only here a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden the flood came in downtown Kingsport and we had to leave the building and meet out in our parking lot. And God has always spoken to us through all those changes and said, you know what? The church has never been, Harvest has never been about a building. It doesn't mean physical proximity. It means that the Holy Spirit's present in our lives and we've been talking about that for weeks. And so we are the church. We are that ecclesia, that, that following Jesus and what he does. And so even though we love to hug each other and I'm gonna try to hug you with my words as much as I can today and we enjoy being together, we are together. You're right here and I'm right here and God's right here. And that's really what we need today. So I'm just going to throw out the, of course, you already know that we are not going to have any activities here for the next couple of weeks. We will be reevaluating on that. And, and let me tell you, we spent as a staff, we all happened to be together yesterday, and we spent a long time uh, discussing the best, the best thing for harvest. And, and as much as we love to be together, because, man, there's nothing we all love more than to be with you on a Sunday morning. We just decided that it's the best thing uh, for what's happening in the country is just to say, all right, let's keep our space a little bit because we know you guys and we know you'd have a hard time following the don't hug thing. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna do this thing right here and we're gonna love on each other. And, and let me tell you, we're gonna worship Lord Jesus this morning. So if you're sitting in your jammies or your shorts or your sweatpants, I'm, I'm trying to imagine a few people uh, in that gear and a, and a big old cup of coffee for you. Same thing. Jesus is going to be glorified. We're going to do what we're going to do. Let me just say for those of you that might be uh, interested, we do have online giving. For those of you that don't know that, you can go to our website, harvesttn.com, and there is a link on there to give, and you can do online giving. So just want to clear that out of the way. I know that you all are missing this morning our great band because, man, they usher us in to the Word of God so well. And because of some kind of rules and laws, I don't even, oh, we can't delete that out. So now you know that I don't like the rules and the laws if you didn't know that before, but we can't have any music playing up here. But it's really hard to jump right into the Word without having something that kind of prepares your heart. So we've got a video that we want you to watch that I think it, it is just going to get you pumped up and in the right frame of mind to be ready uh, to study God's word this morning and glorify Jesus. So let, let's take a look at that video. I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them and then he delivered their enemies to them and he unlocks wounds and he provides water from a rock and he provides manna from heaven and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me, 
by the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything. And he loves you. Okay, I hope that kind of inspired you a little bit in lieu of, of our music, something a little bit dramatic to get the blood pumping this morning. You know, I told you, God, God woke me up at 3 o'clock this morning, and I kind of thought maybe he was going to wake me up and say, uh, I want you to change the message. I want you to have something that, it, that is going to speak into what's happening right now. But you know what? That's not what he said to me at all. In fact, he, he is so brilliant and plans everything out that it was, it was supposed to be, this is a planned day for me to speak today, and, and Bud was going to take a Sunday off. And the message that he already gave me and has been teaching me is the message that's meant for today. We don't need to talk about being afraid. We don't need to talk about things that are going on in the world. The only thing we've ever needed to talk about is the things we've always talked about, which is we're going to talk about Jesus and his faithfulness. And he is perfect, and he's going to take care of all the things that we need. And the Holy Spirit, man, the Holy Spirit is driving this whole thing. You know we've been in this, in this series, and, and so this message really isn't going to deviate uh, from Bud's sermon series, which is called Supernatural. So we're going to call this part three of, of the series Supernatural, and, we're gonna, and he's going to be here next week with part four of the series Supernatural, because we're just going to go on where we were. You know, he and I were talking, and... The fact that this whole, for, for quite a while now, we've had this really long series about the Holy Spirit and that, that God's presence is inside of us, empowering us. And he's been preparing us. He's been preparing us to be the church, to be faithful followers. And so he's going to continue to do that. So today's message, uh, it's, it's part three of Supernatural, but it, it's called Blood and Water. And, and you'll see what that means in just a few minutes. When I first started to, before I was ordained as a pastor, I uh, had opportunities to speak here and there, some at different churches and, and things like that. And I always, I picked the topics. I picked topics that I was comfortable with, that I felt like I knew something about. And, and so although I was trusting God, it, it, it wasn't necessarily that far of a stretch. Uh, but I don't do that anymore. And now I wait for God to tell me. Uh, whenever Bud and I talk and he says, yeah, I'd like a Sunday off. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to wait for the Holy Spirit to drop something. And he just drops something right into my spirit. And, it, and it's, never, it's never a topic that I'm an expert at. So I don't want you to think that I'm standing here as teacher and you're, you all are sitting there as students. I'm, I'm, I'm a student of his word uh, I need to sit at his feet all the time. So the things that I share with you are things that I'm learning right now. And, and the one that he's got me in, the, what I'm going to talk about today, he's had this kind of rolling in me and, and percolating in me or cooking in me for, for a little while now. And, and so we're going to learn together. And so where I've been is uh, several weeks ago, I had a good friend of mine was actually doing uh, a time of teaching. And she was talking about Jesus' crucifixion. And she mentioned something that, that kind of caught my attention. I was like, why didn't I ever really pay attention to that? And she was talking about when Jesus is on the cross and the, the Roman soldiers came and broke the legs of the two criminals on either side of Jesus. And she said, but Jesus' bones were not broken, his legs were not broken to fulfill prophecy. And she went on to teach about some other things, but, but whenever the Lord's trying to get my attention about something, I'll, I'll sort of, I was going to say don't tell anybody this, but this is like out there in the public, so I can't really say that, but I was going to say don't tell Bud, but he's, he's out there <laughs> listening too. I kind of key in on whatever the Lord's saying, did you hear that? And I stop listening to the rest of the message. Well, I, yeah. Well, it's out there now. Now you all know my secret. Um, 
But when she was talking, I stopped listening to her after that because it kind of occurred to me, I don't know, I must have just skipped over all that, that his bones weren't broken, his legs weren't broken. And so I, I, I went back and, and did some research about that. And, and so the Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not mention this fact. They go from Jesus breathed his last breath and says, it is finished, and then it goes to a different scene. Uh, Matthew and Mark talk about immediately the, the, uh, the curtain in the temple is split, and, and Luke talks about some other thoughts that they were having right there. But only in the Gospel of John is this even mentioned about the Roman soldier going up to the two other criminals and breaking their legs. So I... Our, our text for today, and of course, there's not going to be, you're not going to get the words because we can't switch over to do that. So uh, we're going to finally, everybody has to go old school. You have to get your own Bibles out. Isn't that, isn't that great? Well, I guess you could get your phones out. You're all at home and have whatever you want. But we're going to go to John chapter 19. So I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm, I'm trying to see if I can hear from here. All the Bibles that are flipping right now getting to John chapter 19. And so we're going we're gonna to look at starting at verse 28. And probably in most of your Bibles, there's going to be a little heading right above that that says the death of Jesus. So th this is going to kind of tell that whole little piece of a story that's only in the Gospel of John. So you can either follow along with me or you can just listen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that right now, starting at verse 28. This is John 19, starting at verse 28. Later knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus says, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers, therefore, came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. So I was looking for information about uh, the breaking of the legs. And so that was the scripture. That's the only gospel that, that talks about that particular thing. And I, and I thought it was very interesting. So I, this, has been a, this has been a few weeks now. I was kind of was thinking about that. So I wanted to just set with that passage of scripture. So I, I got out some commentaries and looked at some things, but mostly I just sat in the Lord's presence and I said, what, what do you want me to know about this? Is, you know, you keyed me in on his legs weren't broken. And, and so the first thing is that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have everything planned out. They always have. And, and the glorious thing looking from Old Testament to New Testament is that every prophecy that was given has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. And, and so I looked up where that reference is about, there's a reference in Psalms, but I really want to look at um, the reference in the book of Exodus. Uh, you don't have to go there. You can just listen. We're going we're gonna to flip to a couple of places. Uh, but this is chapter 12, and this is the rules that the uh, Pharisees are, are telling all of the nation of Israel about the Passover meal. And so this is what they put. This is chapter 12, starting at verse 43. It says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, 
These are the regulations for the Passover meal. No foreigner may eat it. Any slave you have bought may eat it after you have circumcised him, but a temporary resident or a hired worker may not eat it. It must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. So they're talking about the Passover lamb for the Passover meal, and none of its, none of its bones could be broken. And so this is, this is such a critical time. This is the change from the old covenant to the new beginning, the beginning of, of the church, of, of all of us, right here, right now, when prophecy is fulfilled and none of the final Passover lamb, the one who would be sacrificed for us, none of his bones were broken. And I, I just thought that was super fascinating, and I thought that was what the Lord wanted to teach me. So what I found out, I read a few more things, and... Um, on, on the crosses that were made, there was evidently a, a, a kind of a little, uh, a, a little piece of wood that was put on there, a little, almost like a little bench, where um, if you were on the cross being crucified, it, it got very difficult to breathe because their lungs would start to fill up with fluid. And, and so if they, if they sat on this little bench... It, it relieved some of the pain and some of the stretching in, in their bodies, and they could breathe a little bit. But again, so at this point in time, they were still able to do that. But the, uh, they, they were getting ready to have a, a special Sabbath day. And they didn't, they, you know, the Romans didn't care. They would have left the bodies on the crosses. But the Jews were the ones that said, we can't have this up there, so we've got to make sure, we've got to ease this along to make sure they're dead. So they would take a club and they would break their legs, which meant they couldn't push themselves up onto this bench anymore, and that would hasten the death. But then, of course, they got to Jesus, and they said, he's already dead. And I thought that was what God wanted to tell me, and and at that point, I wasn't prepared to bring that as a lesson yet, but he said, oh, there's a whole lot more here that I want you to see. And so as I've pondered it, I, I did think about um, some more things. And, and the real place that he wanted to lead me to was the piercing of Jesus' side. And number one, that is of such significance because there are other faiths, big faiths that are out there that have said things like, Jesus was real. He, he walked on the planet and he was, a, he was a prophet of God. But they have said he just swooned when he was up there. In other words, they think he just passed out from being up there. They, they, they're trying to claim that Jesus wasn't really dead. So obviously, if you put somebody that's not dead in a tomb, they can get out of there, which, which takes away all the claim of resurrection out of our faith. But John, and he's the only one that mentioned this, John was a witness that because the Roman soldier went over and said, oh, he's already dead, I'm not going to have to break his legs, but there was an insistence, go ahead and pierce his side. And so there is the proof that Jesus was dead because, and I've seen, you know, there's lots of movies uh, about Jesus' crucifixion and uh, a lot of them that I've seen, I kind of went and looked up some uh, some video footage of, of, you know, how they portrayed that. And I tried to read some stuff. But honest to goodness, there's not a whole lot of commentary on the piercing of his side. And so I've seen some videos where there was just a short little, uh, obviously on a, on a long stake, but, a, but just a very short uh, knife edge that just went into his side. A little bit but the more research I did the more I found out that this was a big a, a pretty long uh, spear point and so the the clue is and this is where God wanted me to key in on and this is where he wants us to key in on and we're gonna we're gonna park down right here is the fact that when that when that spear point went in blood and water came out 
And I read that and I thought about it and I thought of all the things I've thought about the, the crucifixion and thought that and, and kind of know the order of how things went. I'm like, okay. And it, and it still didn't really dawn on me until it did. Because I thought, well, that's an odd thing to say, blood and water. Why wouldn't it just be blood? And, and here's the point, and it got me. That spear pierced Jesus' heart. It had to have pierced his heart because around the heart uh, is, a, is a, well, you medical people are going to know this better than me, so if I botch that up, you can just, you know, tell everybody the right way to say it, but it, it, it would pierce the pericardial sac around the heart. And so not only did blood come out, but water came out. And that's so significant to me as I thought about this. And th this, is, this is hard stuff for me to say. I knew this would be a hard message for me to, to talk about. So in other words, if you play that all the way out, we didn't break any of his bones. We broke his heart. The transgressions that happened against him that day were to pay a price for us. And so that spear point went into his heart and blood and water came out and we broke his heart. And I've sat with that and I've thought about that and it, 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 is, it has been profound to me. All of that's been planned. None of that was coincidence. None of that was, it just sort of happened. Every bit of it was so important to fulfill prophecy because, because listen to this. This is in the book of Zechariah. Old Testament, hundreds, hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. And, and this was said in chapter 12, starting at verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. It was prophesied that Jesus would be pierced, and he was. And I knew that part. But I never really understood that it pierced his heart. And to me, it's so significant because everything that was inside of him came out at that moment. Blood and water. Everything that was going to be necessary for us to live. Blood for the atonement of sins. But that water that came out of his broken heart, that was living water. Everything we need to go on. The blood pours onto us for the forgiveness of sins, and we start a journey with Jesus Christ. And then the living water pours onto us and into us as we make that journey towards holiness. I, I love the connections down to the subtle little details of everything that happened in this and everything that's in God's Word. There's so much there that we kind of gloss over really quickly and maybe we don't even think about the words. But think about the idea of water and how important that is in the ministry of Jesus. He begins his public ministry when he comes up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descends in baptism. The very first miracle that Jesus performed. I've often thought about this fact. You would think it would be a healing, a, a raising of the dead. The first miracle Jesus ever performed was turning water into wine. 
And where did that happen? It happened at a wedding. I mean, the, the implications of all this. A wedding represents, a marriage represents Jesus' relationship with his church, with his people. And so his first miracle is taking water and turning it into wine for celebration. Think about the water that Jesus used when he got down on his hands and knees and washed his disciples' feet. Was there ever a call to us to be servants, to not lord anything over anybody, but to get down on our hands and knees with water and carefully wash someone's feet or take care of their needs? And then I, I saved my favorite water thought with Jesus for last. It's a famous one. It's a story that you all probably know well. It's still in the Gospel of John. It's in John chapter 4. Jesus meets a woman, a broken woman at the well. And she is so broken by her past that she doesn't want to be around anybody. She's walled off her life in such a profound way. And Jesus sends his disciples away because he knew they would be distractions. And he waits just like he does. Put yourself into that story. Just like he waits for us. And here she comes to gather water from that well. A broken woman, all alone in the world, except for Jesus. And he says, I'm not going to read that whole story, but he says a couple of things. This is John chapter 4. He says this to her, and he says this to us now, but he said it on the cross when the water poured from his heart as well. Jesus answered her and us, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And then jump down to the verse 13, and this is Jesus again. Jesus answered everyone. I just got to stop right there for a minute. Everyone who drinks this water. See, in the church, I don't, I'm, I'm not talking harvest here, I'm talking the Christian church overall. We've made such judgments and decisions as individuals over who gets in and who doesn't get in. That's one of the big reasons why we don't, we don't have membership here because it's not about who, who belongs to the club and who doesn't belong to the club. You want to come and sit with Jesus, you come and sit with Jesus. He says here, everyone. And we have got to be unified in that again. We have got to rise up and say those words that everyone who drinks this water, that's the regular water, will be thirsty again. But whoever... That's everyone again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Will never thirst. He's wanting to give living water. It poured out of his heart on the cross. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The conditions to get the water, to get the life that Jesus poured out on the cross, do you want it? And if you want it, you just say to him, I want it, and you get it. It's not about rules. It's not about jumping through hoops. It's not about reading your Bible every day or coming to church, because look at this. There's five of us sitting in here right now. But man, we're at church. We're with Jesus right now. And so your condition is believe and ask for it. And you have that. He says a couple other words before he sends her on her way back to her village. This is starting in verse 23. Listen to this. Yet a time is coming 
and has now come. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. I love it when there's repetitive words in Scripture. I love it even more and I key in even more when they're red words because those are the words that Jesus said. So two times here, right away, he says something and then he says it again, which is for, I, you guys paying attention? Are you, are you catching this? Are you hearing this? So listen how he says, the time is coming and it's now. It has come now. When the true worshipers, that's us, will worship in spirit and in truth. Now that spirit there in both places is capital S. So how are we going to worship? We're going to worship through the Holy Spirit because that's a capital S, in spirit. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm, I'm there with you in spirit. It doesn't mean like that. It means we're going to worship through the Holy Spirit because that's capital S, but it doesn't say to stop right there. It says in truth. Jesus says that twice, in spirit and in truth. That is the worship that he gives us. So to me, pulling this all together, what is Jesus saying? That yes, we broke his heart. But even in that moment, he poured out all the life that was in that heart for atonement, but for life, so that we would worship how? In spirit and in truth. That is a profound picture to me right there. But I got, I got one more thing I want to share with you. I, I stand up in front of a lot of people a lot of time and do a lot of teaching, a lot of talking. Um, and and I, think people, I think people are listening to me, but I, I, have, I have parts of me that I share and then there's parts of me that I don't share. And um, this is so fitting, you know, and, and when God tells me to do something, I'm going to do it because this is part three in the series Supernatural. And so we, we've been talking about what does the Holy Spirit do in your life? How is the Holy Spirit active in your life? And, and what's supernatural? I mean, that, is, that word has gotten a weird uh, connotation in our society now with all the like weirdo shows that are on TV with like monsters and werewolves and I don't know, all that kind of stuff. And, and books seem to be really popular on that. But the Lord's working in the supernatural, and, and the Spirit does. And, and so I'm just, I'm just going to tell you that the Holy Spirit gives me visions sometimes. Now, I don't want you to, I, you know, part of the reason I really didn't want to say that is because I don't want you to think that's all weird or anything, or like I, I, like I don't have a Ouija board, and I don't, you know, this isn't weird stuff. This is, for me, this is the way the Holy Spirit uh, uh, communicates with me a lot is in pictures. I, I see things. Sometimes I, sometimes I hear words, d directions, things to do, things like that. We have conversations uh, in my own voice, but I know it's the Holy Spirit, but sometimes I see a picture of something. And I did about this teaching in the book of John. And at first, I, you know, I, I had it a couple of times and, and saw it in, in vivid detail. And I was like, oh, man, that, that is beautiful. I mean, I've spent a couple of days in the last couple of weeks uh, in my home office on the floor with my face down sobbing because it's that powerful to me. And I'm, I'm good with that, but I've, I'm... I'm somewhat uncomfortable with sharing that. And I knew he wanted me to share it. It was going to be one thing that we were all going to be sitting right here, but now it's like out there. Um, 
But he's like, no, no, you, you got to share this because it's important. And so I, I'll tell you what I saw, and it, and it, or I'm seeing it right now. It's not a saw. It's, it's present. Um, it, it's not like a little video. Um, I can't see the whole thing, but I can, I, I am, I'm standing on the ground near the cross. I can't see Jesus. I can, I can, I can see the edge of the cross. I can see where the, where the piercing went in, but I can't really see him because I, I can't look upon, I can't look upon his face. Uh, not, not in this form. One day we're going to get to do that. But I'm staying there, and so what I'm seeing is not now. In, in your mind, when I read that scripture, you might have thought his 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 side got pierced. You're like, wow, it it pierced his heart, and here came water, and a little bit of blood just kind of came down his side. And that that is not the vision that the Holy Spirit has given me. And I I think it's speaking to us today, and 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 so that's why I, I I'm sharing it with you. He's given me a vision, and this is what I see is a spray. I can see the spray in my mind's eye and, and it's like diamonds. It, it's, it's like um, sort of, you know, when you're almost when you're maybe out and, and, and spraying a hose and you might see that rainbow kind of coming into your hose through some of the water. It's almost like that, but it's not rainbow colors, it's clear. And, and that water, and, and I don't see the blood. I see the water spraying out in a, in a, in a kind of showering downward motion that has got prisms. It, it, it's very diamond-like. And, and so I've sat with that. And that, that's, all, that's it. I don't see anything else. I don't see any, I don't see any people there. I know I'm standing there, and, and that's what I see. And so I've, I've sat with that for a couple of weeks and tried to process Lord, that's beautiful. What, what do you want me to do with that? And he said, I want, you, I want you to say those words. And I said, all right, teach me. Teach me about that vision. And, and here's what I believe he's saying. Because you've heard it all the time. You've heard it if you've gone to a church. You've heard it at other places. You know, take your burdens to the foot of the cross and lay them at Jesus' feet. And I think individually, we all do that. We all do that. We all need to do that. But what I think he's saying that I've gotten the best I can get from that vision is that this didn't drip out of him. What was in his heart was under deep pressure. And everything that was in there, all of it came out when that heart was broken, when that perfect heart that deserved to be worshipped and nurtured and cherished instead was pierced and broken and all of that pressure came flying out. All of that living water is spraying out in such beauty, not ugliness. We think of the cross, you know, we, we watch the Passion of the Christ, that movie, and it's so gory and, and bloody and ugly, and the, and the cross was. But the vision that he's given to me is, if my people will come, if anybody will come and say, I want that living water. I need that. I'm walking to that well. I'm walking to that cross broken. I'm all by myself. I feel like everybody has rejected me and nobody's there anymore and a spray as beautiful as diamonds under deep pressure with everything that's in there in Jesus' heart is going to come out and wash over each person that comes on their own before that cross and going, look at this ugliness I have. Look at this spear of my own that I have that I'm going to have to push up into your side. I don't deserve to be here. I'm not worthy to be here. And he doesn't give a little dribble of nothing to us. He sprays out onto us life and the hope of things to come. It is a beautiful thing. And it is not something that is set apart for a cherished few that dress the right way and look the right way and have the right amount of money and have the right words and do the right things and go to the right church. 
It was never about that. It was always about His great love for every single person that would say, I'm dragging myself here with the very last dregs that I have left, but I need you and I want you. And he gives the greatest gift ever. I thought about why, why, Lord, in this vision do I not see the blood? Because the blood has been given and it's done and it's already on us. We're covered, we're changed, and we don't need to see the blood anymore because we're no longer dirty. But what we need to see is what we need to move on. The beauty of the water that pours out of his heart, the living water that's going to cover each one of us. You know, as, we, as we're approaching Easter, first I thought when he, when he kind of was leading me to this whole message, before, before I saw that vision and everything, I thought, oh, this is just kind of a, you know, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't talk about Lent here at Harvest because it's not in the Bible, so we don't talk about it. Um, oh, should I have said that? Well, I said it now. <laughs> Anybody that doesn't go here, you're getting all kinds of little information here. Um, but there's still a, there's still a preparation. We're going to celebrate um, his resurrection in, in a, a few weeks. Is it like a month? It's like a month, right, to Easter, something like that. It, it's coming up on us quickly. And so I thought, well, this is a little prep to get everybody thinking about Jesus going to the cross. And we're going to celebrate his resurrection. But he kind of expanded that out to me. And I started thinking about the word resurrection. And I started thinking about, you know what? Resurrection isn't just something that's going to happen to us when, when these bodies die. And then he's going he's gonna to lift us to newness of life. Today, right here, wherever, wherever you happen to be sitting, he's wanting to resurrect life right now. In, in this very moment. In other words, it's not just our physical bodies that die. It's not just our spirits that were dead, which the blood and the atonement, that part of us comes alive again. It's not just that. He's resurrecting every, every single component about us, which is why, again, when I think about the spraying forth of that beautiful water, when it's going to spray in the kind of spray and the kind of power I saw coming out, it's going to cover every bit of us. It's going to saturate into every part of our life. So what I'll say to you today, Harvest family, and that's all of you, he wants newness of life for you today. So, so maybe for some of you, perhaps, you have just said, I've blown it too bad. I've never walked to the cross. And you know I'm, I'm talking about inside. I've never walked to the cross. I can't walk to the cross. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm too far gone for that. Or you've thought, I won't walk to the cross because it's all hypocrisy. It's all about rules and it's always about, it's always about judgment and being better than somebody else. It's not about that either. In fact, when you walk to the cross, there ain't nobody else there but you and Jesus. You make that journey by yourself. There's nothing in the way of that. And I'm sorry to all of you that might have been hurt by the church someday in your life. Either, either having been there yourself or having seen something on the media or the reactions of people that, that use the name of Jesus but just throw it around like it's garbage. I'm sorry if you've ever been hurt or got the wrong idea of who Jesus is, but that's not who he is. In fact, he saved all that pressure of his heart so that when it's finally pierced that he could just push out in the most incredible way on you. So if you've never walked to the cross that first time, I'm telling you, Jesus is right there. 
And he's saying to you, come on. You don't have to you don't have to fix anything first. You don't have to get your life right. You don't have to do anything except you come on and you kneel down right here in front of me and just say, I'm so broken and I need you so much. And that blood's going to pour over you and then it's going to be gone. Every drop of his blood and every bit that was broken in you you're turned white as snow. But that's not the only thing that happens. In that moment then, the water gushes. It gushes from the wound that we put into his heart and it gives you newness of life. And for those of you that are, that are saying, yeah, I've been to the cross. I, I man, I go all the time. I just, I just keep laying stuff down and I'm like, Lord, I'm, I'm so sorry for this and, and, and forgive me and all of that. That's not the only journey. That's just the starting point. That's where you start. And some of you have been sitting in churches, maybe even this church, for a long time going, you know what? I keep trying to say the right things. I keep trying to put that stupid smile on my face and go and, and pretend I'm praising Jesus, but I don't, I don't feel anything. I still don't like who I am. I still have bad feelings towards so-and-so. I still have all kinds of bitterness. I'm still caught up in, in some kind of sin activity in my life. I hear you. I told you, I'm a student just like you. I've got to go to the cross for the same reasons. What I'm telling you is it, it's not just about atonement. It is about newness of life. And so if you've never read that scripture before and seen that not only does blood come out of his heart, but water, living water, sprays over you in all those places you thought, I, I can't breathe another second. I can't go on another day. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I feel like such a phony. You're not a phony. But you need to drink, drink deep from his cup of living water. See, I think we get to go to that cross now that I've seen that vision with vessels. Big old cup, big old bucket. Not only does it, does it soak us all on the outside, but we get to go and fill it up and fill it up. And that heart is so big and so pure and so strong. It's going to keep pouring that stuff out day after day after day. And so he's saying, bring a vessel with you. And then you pick up that cup and you tilt your head back and you drink that down. As much as you want, it's always going to be here for you. The cross is not a scary, evil place. It is holy ground that you and I can be called to every day. So I'm saying, as you're getting ready for Easter, and I hope all of you are, and I'm not talking about, you know, getting your candy and your eggs and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about getting your head and your heart set. In the book of Colossians chapter 3, in the, in the first verse, Paul tells us, set your heart on things above. And then right after that second verse, set your mind on things above. See, you can't just work it up here and you can't just work it down here. You've got to set both on Him, on His beauty, on His provision, and everything He's going to give for you. And then, if you'll go to Him today and kneel down, whatever your condition is, some of you might be so overflowing with joy you can't stand it. Well, go and run through that place like a sprinkler when you were a kid with the joy of the Lord in your heart and get more. And the point of getting more is to fill you up and then pour it out. Pour it out, pour it out, because he's resurrecting you, and he's resurrecting me today. And I'm telling you what, I've felt this in my bones for a long time, in this very region, that the Lord is calling us to revival in this country, and this is going to be one, I'm just saying it out loud, I'm just saying it, that this will be one of the key places that revival rises up. But for that to happen is people have to rise up, and we have to be unified believers 
and we need to not do, be doing any more of this, my church and this church. And, mm -mm. We are one church and one body and one faith, and we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. So would you bow down today and receive from him and then rise? Rise up today, not with what's going on in the world, but rise up because he's, he's doing something here. He's doing something profound. There's a movement of the Spirit happening like I haven't sensed any time in my lifetime. God is on the move. He's going to minister to us, and then he's going to pour it out. Would you come to that today? Let's pray together. Lord God, I, I, words are my business, and I just don't even have the words of the knowledge that we did not break your bones. That we broke your heart. That we pierced it. And then you did the, the one thing that is not like anything of this world. You gave it all back. You saved all that was in your heart, all that perfect love. And because of the piercing, you sprayed it out onto your people. We have the opportunity, Lord, to, to walk in holiness, to be resurrected today, to begin a, to begin living eternity today and not something that's going to happen. Oh, we'll just sit around and, and, and get through this Christianity thing and go to church and then someday we'll be in heaven and everything will be great. No. You're calling us to rise up and let people see you in us and pour it out and pour it out and pour it out because living water is necessary. It's the only thing that we can pour out onto other people and they need it and we need it. So Lord, in obedience, in full joy and in full hope, we pray that individually you would raise us up. You would resurrect us today, that you would resurrect some place inside of us, even if we're like, man, I'm, I'm doing good. But there's this one place in us that we feel like is still dead or dormant in us. That you would pour out, and today, supernaturally, we would see miracles right, right now, over the internet, for crying out loud. We would, we would see these things happening, Lord. And that we would stand up in front of the cross, and those places in us are not dead anymore. And then we would unify for once and forever to be the one body of Jesus Christ. And we would show people what the church was always meant to be. It was never about us. It's always been about you. And we would pray that now we would rise. We give these offerings of ourselves to you, and as best as we know how, we receive everything that you want to give us. We pray these things in the holy and powerful and healing name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. If I had preached that message with everybody in-house today... Um, the band was not going to come back up, was trying to be, uh, give them a little bit of a break to not learn a new song. Um, and they were going to be doing a big old concert tonight and so trying to, trying to save their voices. But um, the Lord gave me maybe a month and a half ago a song that I'd never heard. Uh, and it, it has been profound in my life. And, and so... Um, are you guys going to be able to put the link to that? The, in the comments are going to be the link to it. But the name of the song uh, is Make Room uh, by Southview Worship. 
So if you go into your Spotify or whatever, or maybe even on YouTube, you might be able to, uh, I know on Spotify you'll be able to pull that up, but it, if you would a, as you're ending, because we can't, again, we can't even do that much here because of uh, licensing things. I, I don't know, don't get me started on that one. I did good up to this point, not too much edit work, so I don't want to blow it now. Um, go listen to that song. Because the, the whole point of it, and it, it's, just been, it's just been sending me to my knees. Will you make room for him? Will you make more room for him? Because that's what he's calling us to. And I'll tell you what, the more room you make, the more you get out of the way, the bigger the vessel gets for the living water. You want to be able to pour out on other people? Make room for him. And he's going to do a mighty thing and revival's going to come on the land. So I hope that you'll go and, and look up that song again. It should be in the comments. Um, I hope wherever you are today that you've been able to feel like you're right here. Because again, it's, it's dark in here in the worship center. They got, a bunch of, they got a bunch of lights on me up in the front. But I'm looking out and I, I see you all here. I see you all here, and I, I love you so much. Um, I'm hugging you with my words. I can't give you a real hug, but I hope you know it's, it's bigger than a real one. And, and we love you, everybody uh, that's leadership at Harvest. We're, we're loving on you guys, and just because we can't be together, oh, we're more together than maybe we've ever been because we are one in spirit and in truth, and that's the way that we'll worship. Have a great day. Have some more coffee. Bud will be back next week. We'll give you an update soon. Love you guys. Peace out.